TV here with you for the next hour, talking professional wrestling and mixed martial arts. Mostly professional wrestling, though, as I can say with full confidence that that is something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. And whether you're joining me through TuneIn or iHeart, American Forces Radio, SportsByline.com, over-the-air affiliates like the Mightier 1090, Sirius XM 156, via podcast or video streaming on Twitch and, and YouTube. However it is that you're joining me, I'd just like to say thank you. We'll go ahead and get this out of the way right now. There it is. Blueberry Red Bull is now open because we have a lot to get into. Do you remember June 15th? It was a, it was a Thursday. Brian decided he, he wasn't going to do the show. I can't remember why. I think he was uh, coming back from cannon beach or, or something like that but he decided you know what show's yours i'm gonna take the day off it was that day that the wall street journal reported on vince mcmahon and a hush pact a nda between he and a former paralegal that worked for the company who was quote passed around like a toy to john laurinaitis that sparked an investigation or was part of an investigation that the WWE board was looking into. And now, today, another day that Brian has decided to take off to spend a little bit of time with his family, a new Wall Street Journal article has come to light with new information on not only Vince McMahon, but John Laurinaitis as well. And we are going to get into all of that when we get back after the break prepare to strap in because if you haven't heard some of the details you know what you may not be shocked but you'll still be surprised to actually see him written out i believe we'll be back wrestling observer live we're live for an hour at a time but if you want to try to get at us 24-7, you can find us all on Twitter. I am at Sempervivi. The timeline for this show is at WONF4W. The broadcaster is at Sports Byline USA. And if you love pro wrestling, at Mid-Atlantic Pod. I was really wondering when I got up this morning, about 7 o'clock Eastern time, what was I going to talk about today? <laughs> And then at 10.15 Eastern Time, the Wall Street Journal published a new story written by Joe Palazzolo, Ted Mann, and Joe Flint uncovering new information uh, previ about previously unreported settlements by World Wrestling Entertainment owner and CEO Vince McMahon to at least four women who have alleged sexual misconduct against the company's chairman. And here we go with this. The total amount paid out over the last 16 years has totaled over $12 million and are part of non-disclosure agreements that the four women signed and prevent them from discussing uh, or pursuing legal claims against the now 76-year-old McMahon. The journal notes that it has reviewed documents as well as spoken to people who are familiar with the matter the biggest bombshells coming out of today's reporting include the report of a seven and a half million dollar settlement with a former wrestler who alleges that McMahon, quote, coerced her into giving him oral sex and then demoted her and ultimately declined to not to renew to not renew. I'm sorry. Pardon me. Ultimately declined to renew her contract in 2005 after she resisted further sexual encounters. The story notes that the wrestler and her attorney approached McMahon in 2018 and negotiated the payment in return for her silence. Also, according to the journal, in 2008, their quote, a WWE contractor presented the company with unsolicited nude photos of Mr. McMahon. She reported receiving from him and alleged that he had sexually harassed her on the job, according to people familiar with the women's 2008 non-disclosure agreement. Mr. McMahon agreed to pay her roughly $1 million, these people said, end quote. 
The story followed by stating, per a 2006 agreement, quote, a former manager who had worked 10 years for Mr. McMahon before he allegedly initiated a sexual relationship with her was paid $1 million to keep quiet about it, according to people familiar with the deal, end quote. Also in 2006, as some of you may remember, an employee at a Boca Raton, Florida tanning salon accused McMahon of groping her, trying to kiss her, and showing her nude photos of himself on his phone. McMahon said, quote, he was only trying to have a little fun, according to the woman's account in the police report. McMahon's lawyer, Jerry McDivitt, told police McMahon denied any wrongdoing and prosecutors declined to file charges, citing a lack of independent evidence. On June 17th of this year, Stephanie McMahon took over as the acting chairwoman of the board and company CEO as Vince stepped aside. Two days prior, the journal broke the story of the WWE's board of directors investigating a secret $3 million settlement McMahon had reached with a former paralegal with whom he is alleged to have an affair with. And there's new reporting there, too, with the journal story stating that people familiar with the matter claim the person in question was hired as a legal assistant in 2019, despite the fact she never applied for the job. The story has a quote saying Mr. McMahon had met her at his Stamford, Connecticut condo building where both were living. The story went on to claim that WWE placed her in the legal department because the woman's resume said that she had attended law school and that the woman often talked with colleagues in the department about her close relationship with Mr. McMahon. And the talk was so frequent that her boss asked her to stop, saying she was making other employees uncomfortable, according to one of those people. That same paralegal, as everyone will remember, was later reportedly shifted over to Talent Relations in 2021 to become the personal assistant of John Laurinaitis, with whom she is also alleged to have an affair. And as everyone remembers, probably from the initial story, uh, there was a quote of her being passed around like a toy, and that came from an email, an anonymous email, that was sent to the board of directors, which ended up opening up this investigation. In 2021, the woman transferred from the legal department to talent relations under Mr. Laurinaitis, who returned to the role he had held a decade earlier, and we have more information on that. Because according to the story, WWE considered raising the woman's annual salary from $100,000 to around $300,000 at McMahon's request, according to people familiar with the matter. The company settled on a base salary of $200,000 and a director-level position. Now, McMahon's lawyer, Jerry McDivitt, in a response sent to the Wall Street Journal on June 8th, made clear that the woman in question did not make any claims of harassment against McMahon and that WWE did not pay any monies to her directly as it relates to her relationship with McMahon, that this settlement was completely paid by Vince. Now, as previously reported, the WWE board is not only looking into that Laurinaitis relationship, but also a one and a half million dollar NDA that was reached in 2012 with another female employee who also claimed misconduct against the former Johnny Ace. And I'm just going to note here that on July 30th, 2012, Laurinaitis resigned after nearly a decade at the head of the food chain. Uh, when it comes to talent relations, he cited burnout and a desire to go back to producing matches, which he did. On March 10th, 2021, Dave Meltzer had broke the story of Laurinaitis' return back to the top of the food chain after WWE had reorganized the talent relations division. On April 22nd, 
2021, Mark Carano was fired as the senior director of talent relations after Mickey James came forward on Twitter with the uh, revelation that talent gets uh, released by the company. And then they have the indignity of having their personal belongings all get shoved into trash bags that are then shoved into a cardboard box and sent back to them. And when he was fired, many WWE uh, former WWE personnel came out and just hammered this guy, including Mike Chioda, Teddy Long, Fred Rosser, three other ones that did, Gail Kim, Jillian Hall, Maria Kanellis, all of whom noted that their belongings were sent back to them into in trash bags. And Gail Kim added that she thought Carano wasn't a very good human being. After he was fired, even Carano's girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, jumped in, alleging that he had stolen WWE title belts, hid them in, under a bed in his guest bedroom, as well as other claims such as him wanting to kill an ex-girlfriend's cat. After Carano was fired, Canellis tweeted, This is not the fault of that one individual. It is a company-wide cultural problem. It comes from the top. The original Wall Street Journal story on June 15th noted that the firm that's investigating the allegations is also assessing WWE's compliance and human relations programs and company culture. Funny enough, earlier today, a WWE source indicated to Sean Ross Sapp and Fightful Select that when McMahon came back to Gorilla following his appearance on the June 17th SmackDown, the same day he stepped aside as chairman and CEO, he shouted, F him. We'll be back. Wrestling Observer Live. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Mike Sempervivi here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. Brian Alvarez will be rejoining me on Monday, spending some time with the family today. Good for him. Shut off your phone. Hide it somewhere. We'll handle this one for you, boss man, because you're going to be called back pretty quick, I have a feeling, by <laughs> Dave. Uh, probably for Sunday night, uh, but we'll have to see with, with Brian's schedule. I know definitely Dave is going to be with Garrett for subscribers of the website. That show should be up. Uh, tomorrow morning, if not late tonight, Eastern time. So look forward to that as well as Brian rejoining Vinny on Sunday for the Brian and Vinny show. And again, maybe possibly also a special bonus edition of Wrestling Observer Radio with everything that is breaking today. We'll see if anything else breaks. Funny enough, there's no announcement that Vince McMahon is going to be stomping out there on, on SmackDown tonight. Funny, funny how that one went. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so you heard how I ended that last segment. This is what Sean Ross App is reporting, that Vince, uh, when he stomped back into the gorilla position after SmackDown on June 17th, where he strutted himself out there, he went to the back and said F him, except he obviously said the whole thing. If that gives you any idea on what he thought about the Wall Street Journal story and the board's investigation of him. Speaking of the board, and I don't believe that we mentioned this this week, on Wednesday, Connor Shell, who was elected to the WWE board last year, submitted his resignation effective immediately. The company stated that in the securities filing that got reported on Thursday. The reason that was given was that Shell resigned due to increased responsibilities that he's taken on at the North Road Company, a newly formed content studio. Quote, Mr. Shell's decision to resign from the board was not due to any dispute or disagreement with the company, its management, or the board on any matter relating to the company's operations, policies, or practices, the filing said. Shell had been added to the WWE's board of directors on June 1st of last year, alongside such names as Steve Conan and Nick Khan. 
and it served as ESPN's vice president of content, including being responsible for the development and production of all live event studio and original content across ESPN's platforms, with one of his more notable achievements being the creation of the acclaimed 30 for 30 documentary series. So Mr. Shell suddenly realized he had so much work that he had to do with this new North Road content company that was uh, that he has created or that he is working for that he just had to quit right this second. So take that for what you will. It may be nothing. It may be something. I have no idea. But it's interesting that somebody, usually when somebody steps down from a board... Unless there is some sort of family issue or something like that, there is usually a large grace period where they just very much step back and their duties are taken on by other people. And that would be it. He's leaving immediately. So there is that. We will shift news a little bit here before we get to tonight's SmackDown as Kota Ibushi has provided an update on his injured shoulder as well as his thoughts on some of the announcement practices of New Japan. Uh, <laughs> Bushi hasn't wrestled since the finals of the G1 last year on October 21st. His match against Kazuchika Okada, or Kazuchika Okada, that night had to be stopped early due to Bushi suffering a shoulder injury. He recently responded to several questions from fans on Twitter regarding his injury. Bushi noted that his shoulder appears to be getting worse. Uh, transla translations of Ibushi's tweets have been provided by uh, at the Feelite, and uh, <laughs> this is up on the main page, uh, WrestlingObserver.com. One of Abushi's tweets stated, Sadly, my shoulder is getting worse. I have done my rehab according to the instructions and guidance of my doctors and trainers, too. I'm not risking anything this time. Uh, also, my shoulder won't move at all, so I probably overdid it for many years. Yeah, well, that's that's possible, Coda. Um, I can see one day Tetsuya Naito just uh, coming to that realization as well, too. Uh, another quote said, However, physically, it's been eight months, and I still can't do a single push-up, so I'm making a calm decision. I'll say it again and again, but I'm not giving up. Another one ran on the read. <laughs> this is just, I mean, it's brutal. If I wrestled now, my shoulder would dislocate in less than a minute. <laughs> I'm sorry that it's gotten worse and made daily life difficult. Instead of having rested again for a little under a year, I will do everything I can to take care of my mother. And, of course, we remember the situation with his mother who... Uh, attempted suicide uh, in the midst of all of this stuff happening between Kota Ibushi and New Japan and all of the the relationship which has crumbled over this year. Ibushi himself went on to state that their relationship is still icy right now. He specifically mentioned the company announcing him for the New Japan Cup when they knew he would not be ready to return by then. Quote, they announced it, knowing that having me return by March 1st was impossible, a scam, unquote. So that wasn't just hope that Kota Ibushi would be back. That sounds flat out like they had... Uh, that was a promotional malpractice there. You know, you can't be false advertising people, especially people on the level of Kota Ibushi. And that is exactly what Ibushi is claiming that New Japan did. So this story is going to be far from over. But uh, for anybody out there that was hoping that maybe we would get a return of Kota Ibushi by the time the Dome Show rolls around in uh, January of 2023, it's uh, still looking very, very doubtful right now. Going to turn it back a couple of days because as the show ended yesterday, we got the news of Wednesday's AEW Dynamite numbers, 990, excuse me, 979,000. You know what I need to do? I opened the damn thing. Never took a real sip of it. Ah, got to get back on track here. Got too much of the mush mouth happening here. Too much dry mouth be going on. 979,000 viewers on TBS for Dynamite. 
That number was down a little over 4% from the previous week's Blood and Guts episode. It's still the second highest viewership that the show has gotten since April 6th. It was number one on cable again with a .36 rating in the 18 to 49 demo. That's the same number the show drew last week and matches Dynamite's best number since April 20th. It's also the third straight week that Dynamite has topped the Wednesday cable charts in the demo. Real Housewives on Bravo was second this week with a .30. And I'm not sure which show was not on this week. I don't know. I don't know which shows. Is it Love and Hip Hop? Is it uh, obviously Real Housewives is back? As I mentioned a couple days ago, there aren't any more below decks happening soon. We're going to get a lot more of those when the fall comes. So I don't know what females 12 to 34 had been watching, but they all seem to come back to Dynamite on Wednesday night because that was up 47% from the previous week, Dynamite had a higher rating with females than males in that age group, which has never happened before. It's the most females 12 to 34 since the very episode of the show, first episode of the show in October of 2019. So for whatever the reasoning was, they all flocked back this week. People 25 to 54 were down nearly 11% from last week. And people over 50 were down 9.5%. So those people got their blood and guts and were out of there. Uh, The number would have been just as high as blood and guts, though, apparently, though, if those people had stuck around for this week. Speaking of AEW, John Moxley, their champion, is scheduled to headline New Japan's Music City Mayhem show taking place in Nashville as a part of StarCast 5 weekend and Ric Flair's last match, all that stuff uh, available on Fight TV. He's going to be taking on El Desperado in a no DQ match. Man, Desperado had issued a challenge to Moxley after a New Japan Roadshow event in Tokyo last week. And uh, since Desperado was a part of the Jericho Appreciation Society and the uh, Suzuki Gun faction that attacked John Moxley and the rest of uh, the, the Blackpool Combat Club leading into Blood and Guts, Moxley wants a little bit of revenge. So <laughs> this is the first match. That has been announced for that show. Uh, Kushida and Hiromu Takahashi are also scheduled to appear as well. All of this stuff will be taking place while the G1 Climax will be going on. And I've said it a lot on this show. Every time I do a solo show and something about New Japan comes up and I can shoehorn in how good Desperado is, I always do so. I always say if you want to pick out one match of his, you see him uh, out of the junior heavyweight element and against Uh, a real star and holding his own watch him against Okada from a couple years ago I'd have to pull up cage match to see exactly when that match took place but it was a really really good one and showed off the Desperado to me I mean you make a list I'd say he's one of the top 10 15 20 workers in the world I think it would be it would be tough to deny him at least being in the argument for that and he gets to show off his wares against John Moxley in a match that on paper, my favorite Moxley, but Desperado's got a history of plunder and getting it in as well. We have a lot more to get in coming up here in this final segment. We shall do so on Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper Vivi here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. Brian Alvarez will be back with me on Monday. Crazy world we're in. Shinzo Abe. That assassin, that's what I woke up to this morning. It was the first thing I saw, that Japan's former prime minister was murdered, was shot in Japan this morning. Man, this is not going to be a good day. And uh, hopefully uh, it is a good day wherever you are, and hopefully if it's not a good day outside, uh, that it's a good day mentally for you. Um, I wonder what the day is like mentally for Vince McMahon today as he... Gets ready for SmackDown tonight. It's just, this is amazing. And it's, <laughs> to go back to, <laughs> and I was going to move on from all this. I went a whole segment, really, with only talking about it at the, the very beginning of the last segment. But John Laurinaitis being put back into a head position. Now, I know, technically, 
Stephanie, and at one point, Triple H, and, I, and I, I'd have to go back and, and go to the corporate website and see the exact titles for everyone. But like Stephanie and Triple H have at times been on the the flow chart higher than John Laurinaitis, but he's always been that go-to guy. And Mark Carano was then kind of that guy. He became the hatchet man, seemingly. And this stuff happens with Laurinaitis in 2012. He is... Much like, you know, like when, and uh, you know, if I recall my history correctly, like when they were ready to get Khrushchev out in, in the Soviet Union, he was he was tired and he needs a rest. And I definitely remember when it was getting Gorbachev out of there that, you know, well, he's tired, he needs a rest. And those coups, in one coup in one place and the other case, I guess it was Brezhnev. I can't even remember who took over uh, for Khrushchev, but... It, the fact remains that they were very tired. And John Laurinaitis got very tired of what he was doing, and he was placed into a producer's role in 2012 after somebody there, Vince McMahon for sure, being one of them, knew that an NDA for $1.5 million was signed. He's brought back after Mark Carano, who's... Again, there were a lot of things said after the fact about Mark Carano or things that were alleged or indicated by former wrestlers about him not being that great of a guy and maybe having some issues with female talent. We hear we heard how some of the female talent described him and after he's gone a month before that, John Laurinaitis, with all the shifting that went on, he was placed back at the top of the food chain. There may be a problem with the corporate culture there. And we'll just have to see how things play out, I guess. But... Stephanie McMahon looking more and more like she could very easily stay in that position at the top. But how much she knew about a lot of the things that took place as a member of the board of directors and as a member of the family is going to be into question. Same thing when it comes to Paul Levesque. Same thing when it comes to Kevin Dunn, who's on the board. All these people that have been there a long time. What did you know? When did you know it? Because if we're investigating corporate culture, we're investigating all of these other things that go along with this, the human resources part, all of that stuff. While all of that's going on, it's easy to say, OK, with Stephanie in, that should kind of soothe the matters here. But they're going to be looking back and like all of this stuff was taking place. And technically, if your name was at the top of the flow chart, that was Shouldn't it kind of sort of also be on you? Can they pass that buck? I don't know. Really interesting, though, obviously. Also, I made a joke earlier on on Twitter today about people drawing lines using that Brian Windhorst thing when he was on ESPN talking about Utah and the trades that were made in the NBA and they're clear in my way. And what for? And made a joke about people, you know, to all the the Twitter conspiracy theorists trying to draw lines and trying to figure out who the women are. And I felt bad about making that joke, even though I just meant it as a, a play on the meme, because there's probably people that are, have gone out there and tried to do that, to which I would say you're a pretty crappy human being to do that, because unless you are a, an accredited member of a media source, and even then, if you are don't don't it's not your business most of these women are tied by these agreements they can't talk and for them to forego those agreements and get into a legal battle with wwe in the hopes of trying to land a book deal or something like that no nah. so don't do that because uh, apparently one jackass did the last time around and was thoroughly 
uh, beaten down for it. And uh, probably, at least online, physically, probably those people should be beaten down as well, too. Because, again, it's sticking your nose where it doesn't belong, and it's doxing somebody who doesn't deserve it. So hopefully everybody, as this story goes on, and if more things come out, hopefully... Uh, there's a level of decorum that continues to take place, and uh, maybe some of these things uh, should be left to the professionals because it seems like right now the Wall Street Journal is pretty uh, doing a, a really a really good job of all of it. So, gonna switch it back here to things that take place back in in, in a wrestling ring. Or at the very least, negotiations that take place about possibly putting things in a wrestling ring and. AEW and Bushy Road uh, apparently may be talking about such things because Dave Meltzer reports in today's or in this week's Wrestling Observer Newsletter, which was published today for subscribers over at WrestlingObserver.com. There has been communication between the two companies, and while there is no arrangement as of now, we are told to expect something. Meltzer noted that Stardom is interested in having some of AEW's talents work there, including Tony Storm, who has shown interest in wrestling there, a former uh, a former uh, the Cinderella winner. Uh, and no specific details have come out, but this really isn't a surprise. Stardom owned by Bushi Road, the same company that owns New Japan Pro, and is the number one women's promotion on the planet has been that way uh when shimmer runs the weekend damn it i would say that they were the number one promotion in the world but really even though there's a lot of them out there a lot of them of note pro wrestling eve and uh tokyo joshi pro and many others stardom is really as of now the gold standard and it's only going to be a good thing <laughs> to have a relationship uh with 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 stardom whether it be directly with stardom whether it be through new japan strong whatever it is however it works out it's going to be better for all of those women in aew all of these young people that they have under contract to be able to go out and get some seasoning it's been reported thunder rosa going back to tokyo joshi pro there are plenty of women Miu yamashita there there are plenty of women that we can see crumb over here and work Obviously, when it comes to the stardom roster, I mean, you know, take your picks. You know, obviously, if Io Shirai goes back there, which a lot of people expect her to do at some point, much like Kari Hojo, Kari Sane did, you know, her presence in AEW or on a show, whether it be a one-off, whether it be a special event, whatever it would be, would be a big deal. Kari Sane coming over would be a big deal. You know, Atami Hayashishida, the Suris of the world, the Natsupoys of the world, the Cosmic Angels of the world, the Tams of the world. You know, they all have good names, but they'll probably need, you know, a little bit of work. And by dripping them more in and by having more people having matches over there, having women go over and work with these people, somebody hears about it. Maybe it helps drive Stardom World sales because people hear about how good these matches are and they want to take a look at them. So... You know, anytime that these companies want to work with each other, it's never a bad thing. Um, WWE, NXT, they don't really work with anybody, but they apparently have a major event that's looking to be taking place next month. Also in this week's Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Dave reports that the next special is tentatively being planned for late August. Mentioned that Saturday, August 20th and Saturday, August 27th are possible dates for the show. Uh, in fact, uh, the, this day wrote the don't call it a takeover show. This would be the first NXT streaming special since June's In Your House event. A special episode of NXT, The Great American Bash, was also aired on the USA Network this past Tuesday and featured four title matches. So August marks the one-year mark since the last NXT TakeOver event, NXT War Games, in uh, December of 21, NXT Stand and Deliver in April of 22, and NXT In Your House of June of 22 have taken place since the NXT 2.0 rebrand happened. For all of you who will be watching SmackDown tonight, I won't go through everything that's going to happen on Rampage because Fauntleroy did that for all of us yesterday, but I can let you know 
If this makes a, a difference, and it may for some of you out there, if it came down to Brian Alvarez and, it, and it, it was between Corey Graves and Pat McAfee, and you told him Pat McAfee was not going to be on SmackDown tonight, and Corey Graves was, Brian Alvarez, if he could avoid it, would use that as an excuse to not watch the show. Unfortunately, he will not be able to do that. But on WWE's After the Bell podcast, Corey Graves revealed that he would be the host alongside Michael Cole tonight at the uh, American, because McAfee, pardon me, is that is in Lake Tahoe for the American Century Championship Celebrity Golf Tournament. I hope he is there in the neck brace that he wore to UFC 276. How could he not? Have you, has anybody, I don't know, I'm not a big golf fan or anything, but like I know they do these like pro ams and they do these types of events like, you know, before like PGA events and stuff like that. And there's always some sort of ridiculousness taking place. Bill Murray doing something crazy or something like that. So Pat McAfee out there and the, uh, you can't call them wife beaters anymore. What do they call them? The uh, the 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 t shirts, the uh, with the no sleeves and the whatnot, the undershirts and and all that. He'll be out there in that and his neck brace and probably a beer uh, if he's to be known. But McAfee and Corbin are going to be uh, wrestling on SummerSlam July thirtieth on um, Thursday. It was announced that McAfee signed a multi year contract extension with WWE, and uh, tonight's SmackDown takes place at the Dickies Arena in Fort Worth, Texas. And they have announced a few things for the show, including that Drew McIntyre will once again battle Sheamus in what they call a high-stakes matchup for the right to challenge either Roman Reigns or Brock Lesnar for the undisputed WWE Universal title at the WWE Clash at the Castle premium live event. Also on the show tonight, this may be the thing that matters the most. Universal Champion Roman Reigns is going to be making his appearance alongside, well, not alongside, but Liv Morgan, the brand new women's SmackDown champion, is going to be there. And with Wimbledon in full swing, as WWE says on its own website, Max Dupree and his recently introduced Maximum Male Models, Massey and Mansoir. Will look to win over the WWE Universe in straight sets when they unveil their dynamic 2022 tennis collection. We'll be back to put a bow on this thing. Wrestling Observer Live. TV here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. Final little short segment here. So wear my Hawaii Rainbows jersey. I I question why the Atlantic Coast Conference isn't looking at them to add them as a member. Because I mean, hey. If AEW can have the All-Atlantic Championship and have people from Japan fight for it, why not bring in Hawaii? I mean, in a couple of years, the way it's looking, you'll be down to having maybe Wake Forest play Appalachian State in the ACC title game. Maybe. I don't know. Don't be Tammy Sitch, everybody. That that I saw another thing in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter that... Uh, that, that Sitch uh, is filing for a public defender, no income, $28,000 in debt, down to $2,500 in the bank. She bragged about her OnlyFans. Apparently, she had a, a hot first week, and after that, <laughs> Dave also wrote that her boyfriend and fiancé, 40-year-old James Pente, who owned the car that Sitch was driving, was lectured by Judge Karen Foxman when Assistant State's Attorney Ashley Trewilliger claimed in a Daytona Beach News Journal story that as she was passing him by in court, she said, quote, he called me a dirty blank, among other things that I dilly didn't fully catch. The judge told Sitch, because Pente was not in court at the time, that if her fiancé did that again, he would not be allowed in court and threatened him with contempt. They are a contemptful couple, that is for sure. Be more like Kevin Owens, who surprised Bruce Brudro, the uh, Vancouver Canucks head coach, during the NHL draft. Bruce Brudro, who I remember from his time with the Washington Capitals, bounced around with a, a bunch of different hockey teams, is a big pro wrestling fan. And now that he was visited by Kevin Owens during the draft, uh, Bret Hart is no longer his favorite professional wrestler, KO is. You know what, folks? You got choices. You can be like Tammy Sitch. You can be like Vince McMahon. Or you can be like Kevin Owens. 
And I'm not perfect, but I know the person that I most want to aspire to. And uh, that person I would like to get a cup of Tim Hortons coffee with sometime. I thank all of you for joining me today. Thank producer, uh, all of you producers out there. Jared, Daniel, all of you, all you for listening. We'll be out. Rusty Server Live. See ya.